I'm very happy to now introduce Joanna Reuter. Uh, she is from the Netherlands Space Office and will be talking about Earth observation, land data, and services beyond 2022. So welcome, Joanna. Thank you so much. Um, originally, my colleague Raymond Slaute was invited, and when I asked him for advice on what to talk about today, he said, just inform them and inspire them and make the presentation your own. So um, I attempted to do just that. Um, um, yeah, so the information part hopefully will be that I will dive a little bit deeper into what is NSO actually and what is our role um, as the National Space Agency. And then I chose one of the programs that we are executing for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as an example of the work that we do and I think how a lot of the European policies that we heard earlier today already about and a lot of the data, et cetera, sort of can come together in a national program and how we execute that. Um, oops, I have to go one back. Um, so the Netherlands Space Office um, is, we are the National Space Agency and as such, uh, we advise upon and execute the national space policy. Um, our teams are listed above, uh, unfortunately in Dutch, so apologies for everyone who doesn't speak Dutch, um, uh, but the most important thing is that we have four subject teams that are all about the use of satellite data and the support of the sector that is the space sector, um, uh, and we have that definition quite a broad one in the Netherlands. Then institutional programs, which is everything from ESA to the Commission, um, and then the last one being um, global sustainable development. And that is also the program that I will dive into a bit more. Now about the space policy. Our role is not to make the policy itself, but to advise upon the policy. Um, and this year is actually a year that we do just that, um, going towards the ESA ministerial later this year. Um, and I was hoping that I could really share the actual document with you today, but unfortunately it has not been yet published uh, last week as it was originally promised. So you will have to just uh, wait a little bit, uh, which means that I can't say anything um, much in detail, but I will just give a little bit of an abstract overview of what is in the document for now. Um, in terms of how the process works, we have the policy advice always in two steps. So now uh, the first one document is a bit more of an abstract overview in terms of the topics, the strategy, the goals that we want to work towards as the Netherlands. And then the second half of the year is really a breakdown of the budget in terms of the programs in ESA that we want to subscribe to and with what amount. Um, some of the changes this time round, so compared to the, the, the three years ago, um, is that we are working towards a more long-term strategy for the Netherlands when it comes to the space policy um, around four topics. And these four topics are care for planet Earth, discoveries in the universe, uh, innovation and growth, security and strategic autonomy. And that goes very much hand in hand with um, the policy goals of the ministries that we as a, as a space agency work towards too. Um, to go just a bit deeper in uh, the four topics, innovation and growth is all about the, the space sector in and of itself with ESTEC, the, the ESA location that we have in Nordwijk and uh, here in the Netherlands. And our goal is to, to continue sort of the space campus that we've built there and even um, invest into a space campus um, and, and a flourishing space industry in Nordwijk. Security and strategic autonomy is, is everything from um, uh, Galileo um, in the Netherlands, so any navigation um, secure connectivity, but a lot of it has been also on uh, space traffic management. And that is very much hand in hand with uh, the commission uh, goals and uh, the space regulation um, and how we do that nationally. Then care for planet Earth, I think is mostly what, why we are here for today, um, which is everything from satellite applications um, and how they can be used both for monitoring the environment, but also societal applications. And lastly, discoveries in the universe. Uh, the Netherlands has a long history of uh, astronomy, um, and this is something that we want to support in the future as well. Now, the advice that you saw um, this time around is, it is a bit more broad compared to traditionally very much focused on the ESA programs. Now we're going a bit broader, and how can we really get the different ministries within the Netherlands to embrace space as a subject that they can use, um, satellite applications, something that they can really integrate within to their um, policies. Um, we have also some other instruments that we can use in order to do just that. And here I listed just a few. I want to highlight the SPEAR, that is the second um, to the, of the bottom. The Small Business Innovation Research is something that we've been using quite a bit. 
Um, it's an instrument where a government organization, be it a ministry or a municipality, comes with a question and they say, I have this problem. Um, is there a way we can solve it with satellite data? And then that ministry or municipality would also be the user um, uh, of that service after it's been finished. We've executed quite a bit of SPS in the meantime. We have uh, developed some services for the police force, for the uh, fire brigade in the Netherlands um, when it comes to uh, a risk map of the Netherlands where uh, there could be a risk for nature fires, etc. Um, and it's something that we want to push further because there's a lot of um, potential still in the Netherlands and, and I think all over Europe to use more satellite-based services. Um, now I need some help with the video. <laughs> Because this second part now is to dive a, dip beat, a bit deeper into the Geodata for Agriculture and Water program, and I'll just kick it off with a video so I don't have to explain everything. Thank you so much. Um, it's always the same with YouTube, isn't it? That's okay, I'll go through it. Um, so the Geodata for Agriculture and Water program was commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and started in 2013, or that's at least when we lead the discussions around the program, what can we do, how can we do it started. Um, and I think what's quite interesting about this is that normally the space budget really comes from the Ministry of Economic Affairs um, and Climate in the Netherlands, or primarily so. But in this case, it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under the development aid budget that said um, food security in developing countries, I'm sure there's something that we can do based on satellite data. Um, and they actually put 60 million into this program, and then there was another 30 million that came from the private sector um, into developing these type of services. At the start of the program, there wasn't really a lot of services um, in developing countries such as this. Um, but in the last 10 years, uh, the market has really exploded um, with creating actually quite new challenges for farmers themselves. Because in Kenya, I think there's an application now to uh, map all the other applications that are available for farmers and rate them in, in terms of the um, quality of the data that is in these applications. And I think the last mapping was something like 77 different information services for smallholder farmers in Kenya alone. Um, having said that, that is not the case in every country, um, but there is some where uh, I think development aid efforts and, and, and some other efforts have led to really like an, a crazy market for these type of services. But coming back to the G4AW program in and of itself, um, we are in the last year of the program. We have had 25 projects in 15 developing countries, and uh, the type of services range quite significantly based on which region you are in and what crop we are um, tackling, 
We have some uh, really crop-specific um, advice um, where also Wageningen University has been involved, such as the Geo Potato Project in Bangladesh, which was a pest and disease uh, model um, for potato crops. Um, then we have some others that is more uh, a crop um, selection advice or crop management and a lot of good agricultural practices. And I think something that Tom mentioned also this morning is financial services, um, which is becoming increasingly popular. As we see that smallholder farmers, um, the first step indeed is to give them actionable information that they can act upon, but the second one is if they don't have the means in order to buy the fertilizers that they need or uh, the pesticides, then uh, they can't really increase uh, their yields. Um, so the second step would really have to be access to financial services. And financial services in sort of a broader sense than um, it is both microloans, but also insurances, and um, pensions. And I think one of the earlier speakers also managed, uh, mentioned um, index-based insurances, which has become increasingly popular. Um, these are the countries that we are active in at the moment. Um, as I said, this uh, program is coming to an end, which means that we have a lot of lessons learned when it comes to both the data that is being used in the type of services, so what satellite data really from the Landsat to which sentinels and in what way they have been used, how platforms have been integrated and or not, and what were the challenges there. So you see a lot of the themes that were already addressed this morning coming back also in our program quite significantly. But also, I think one of the main challenges was the complexity of satellite data processing and, and all these platforms and bringing all of that down to a level that a smallholder farmer gets information that he or she understands and can act upon and also does so continuously is quite a big step. Because in some regions, um, such as in Sub-Saharan Africa, we still work with call centers, right? So the farmers uh, get maybe an IVR, they can call into a call center. And I was in Ghana just a few weeks ago visiting one of these call centers. And then they get uh, the specific weather forecast or they get information on the crops that they want to um, uh, harvest or uh, et cetera. So um, getting the information to the farmer so he or she can act upon it is really quite a challenge. Um, just a few examples. I think I've mentioned these already um, of the types of services that um, are prominent in our program. Um, and what becomes still, um, and, and this is a bit to my surprise, um, what is still really important is weather forecasts and, and really specific good quality weather forecasting, which is such a big challenge and remains a big challenge. And that is, as we see, uh, really sort of the first and, and, and foremost service that uh, farmers need access to. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the business models behind this because, I mean, we are a public organization. Um, this is really uh, public funding that we went into this program. But our goal was, or, or better yet, the challenge that we gave these consortias um, under G4AW is to um, create a service that could be picked up uh, by a business owner after three years of projects, um, a project time, um, so they can really become financially sustainable, so the farmer can continue to receive the information that they have received uh, during the project phase. This is a huge challenge, as you can imagine, as we force this consortium into a public-private partnership and then um, into sort of a project uh, construct with a lot of heavy administrative burden from our side and that from the ministry. And then in three years, we expect them to come out as an entrepreneur and a business and to have an amazing business model. And I think this is what also this project um, that uh, Tom is now leading is really so important because um, the better we understand a lot of the processes that go on in the background and the better we can do that, the better information we have available, both spatial resolution, temporal resolution, et cetera, actually makes these business models. And it makes them affordable in a way that we can continue with these type of services for, for, for sectors such as smallholder agriculture in developing countries that have not traditionally had these type of services. Because I think there's a difference a, a bit, and I won't go in too much detail into this, between sort of the agtech and the fintech, so the agricultural advice and the financial services that the farmers get. And while there might be already a bit more of a business model for the agricultural services, the financial services still uh, the feedback that we get over and over and over again, it is too expensive at the moment to really make it commercially viable. Um, viable. Um, and, and I mean, the charts that you see up here are really sort of um, in support of that statement, unfortunately. Um, I just have quick two um, examples of projects that I wanted to show you. One uh, that has 
gained quite a lot of uh, attention the last few months. We call that the TomTom -tom of our services because it's a, a routing advice for her and pastoralists, so it's not smallholder farmers, but smallholder pastoralists, so they know where to go with their cattle so they can find uh, grazing grounds, uh, and have access to water, etc. cetera. Um, the interesting side effect that I think this project hadn't really foreseen is that um, in their service, they also include the farmer plots, um, so the pastoralists can go around the farmer plots, which actually um, created a lot of tension between uh, the stationary farmers and the pastoralists in the past, so there was a lot of conflict locally created with fights over uh, grazing grounds, which can be um, prevented by these type of services as well. Then an index-based insurance example from Uganda. The success factor in this project was that actually the local government really embraced it and is now subsidizing the index insurance themselves. So the farmer gets a cheaper version of the insurance. Um, and that way this project really could have been continued um, and is still being continued even though the, the, the subsidy from our side has stopped. And lastly, an example, gap for a in Burundi. Um, they are also now scaling to other countries, but um, what is really wonderful about this example is the inclusiveness of it, because they work with G50 groups, so they work with community groups rather than individual farmers. They have um, created a way in which more marginalized groups of from the local communities are included and taken with the services, because this is still remains a bit of a challenge in how can you really reach the different types of farmers in a community that have various um, yeah, sizes of land, um, sometimes female farmers are left a little bit behind, um, and with this approach they have managed to be a lot more inclusive in their approach and, uh, and reach more farmers. But I think I've mentioned a lot of the lessons learned already, um, but um, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of them on the data side, I think, especially when it comes to making these type of services commercially viable and, and bring them further into the private sector. There remains a role for the public sector as well, and I think that is the conversation that we're having with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs now. We are actually working on a new program or a continuation of the current program um, that we want to start at the middle of next year. But first of all, um, we have taken a really a, a look into what are the lessons learned from this program. And we have a whole report, and I don't know if it's usable at all for your project, Tom, um, to look into the data. Yeah, I'll share it with you. The data um, and, and all the lessons learned from the data side as well. Then you can find a lot of our lessons learned here. Um, and I also wanted to quickly mention that we have a conference coming up where we will share a lot of the experiences if any of you are interested in joining. Uh, and last but not least, before I forget, I have also included the contact details of my colleague Raymond Slauter because he is um, from the Netherlands Space Office in charge of the Green Deal, the Horizon programs, as well as Copernicus. So if any of you are interested in any of these topics, please feel free to reach out to me and or him. Thank you so much for your attention. We're going to um, set up Slido. Uh, I think we have a few questions that are, these are the most recent at the top. Okay, great. We have a little more time in the sessions this afternoon, so hopefully we can get through a couple more questions. But let's start with the top. How ready are smallholder farm, oh, how ready are smallholder farmers in G for WA countries for climate change? Um, very good question. Uh, we also call G4AW a climate adaptation program because we do think that we make them a bit more resilient with the information that we give them, especially in the index insurance, because they get a payout if there's been a drought or a flood, um, if they have a loss on their um, crops. Um, so hopefully it's better, but I think something that I forgot to mention, um, it's also the whole monitoring and impact of this program. Uh, there's been an extensive evaluation of it, also looking into can we actually use satellite data to, to measure the impact that we have had with G4AW. That remains a challenge. Um, so if any here of you here have interest in how do you monitor the impact of these type of programs, I'm happy to hear it. Um, I'll continue to another question because there's a lot to be said. Definitely. Um, Why don't you choose one? I think these are all recent ones at the top. Um, that has a lot of likes, yeah. Uh, okay, should I read this one out? This number three over here? Uh, the usable data. Um, so there's both 
there's all three of them. So I, I like the way it was phrased, the question, because technical, social, as well as educational issues, technical would be um, uh, access to smartphones, feature phones, or even if they have access to a feature phone, possibly not the money in order to call a call center, or et cetera. Um, these are some of the issues there. Um, social, um, we've had issues at the very beginning of the program where um, uh, there were female farmers that got IVR messages, but with a male voice. And then uh, the, the husbands um, uh, had problems with um, the female farmers receiving male voice messages, and then there was some uh, abuse, unfortunately. So we've looked a lot into the communities, into what type of voice do you need and, and, and for what farmer and, and other issues with that. And we really asked our projects to be vigilant on these type of social issues surrounding the services and how the information is received. A big one is uh, local languages. Um, I think one project in South Africa that we have is translated the information in 14 local languages. Um, so I think that's the main thing and, and sort of the first step to really take what local languages are used and how many local languages do you need to translate the service into. Um, soil data. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a very, very, very big bottleneck and something that also comes back in our projects because I think the use of really good spatial resolution soil data would be fantastic for these type of programs. Um, we don't have it in a lot of the projects and there's very little at the moment that we do as the Netherlands Space Office um, in terms of programs on cell data, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I'm happy to look into it and how we can support cell data in Africa more in the future. Okay, I think that's all of our questions. Good. Thank you so Thank much. You so much.